uh good evening everyone uh i hope all of you are safe wherever you guys and girls are uh i would like to thank frameworks for giving us this opportunity to have this uh chat and a conversation with uh, mr steve wright a legendary mr steve wright if i should say uh it's it's a, it's an honor to share the screen with him and talk to him today uh thank you again frameworks one of the india's premier education institute uh, when it comes to visual effects and animation for giving us this uh, platform uh some if uh, we could have mr steve right join us right now that would be great hey <laughs> hi steve uh, hello amit hey steve how are you doing good morning there very good we're all safe in in uh, south carolina <laughs> that sounds amazing So for those of you who don't know about Steve he is a legend he's a legendary nuke master trainer uh many of the first generation nuke artists in india still talk about him with reverence uh he has uh, since 2005 trained around more than 1000 artists on visual effects compositing his uh, training clients include some of the top visual effects studios like pixar framestore prime focus disney feature animation and lot more like that uh his training website offers a complete 2d and 3d new compositing training webinars on vfx and shortcuts uh his experience uh, with uh, as a senior visual effects compositor for more than 20 years of production and on over 70 feature films i think that says it all uh, he's also authored two of the most significant books to be out there on digital compositing which we'll of course talk about it uh, when we come to that So Steve welcome to this webinar again 11 times to India 12th time on a webinar <laughs> Thank you Amit it's a pleasure to be here delighted to talk to India again <laughs> Yeah So let's get the ball rolling and in India we always go back to the roots you know so mm -hmm. especially uh, when it comes to visual effects and animation uh, we here have a mix back of people who are from different educational background uh some from fine arts some from physics maths physics like i am uh who joined this industry physics yeah i'm physics grad yes really that really? was my major so yes uh, so yes. we just like to know what would, what was your academic background uh well by an astonishing coincidence i was a physics major and a math minor <laughs> Remember when I started there were no schools no teachers no books and no manuals okay so um I learned in the school of hard knocks <laughs> about compositing uh because when I I opened my own studio in in Hollywood and we were just doing 3D and I said no we 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 were giving the our 3D stuff to the client who would take them to the to a post house for compositing and I said no we have to we have to give them a finished shot we have to composite it here there was nothing this before after effects there there was nothing that you that on the market to composite two two pictures together except for the pixar computer that was a big box made by pixar for image processing so i got one of those and i started you know figuring it out and uh so i taught myself compositing on this It's a scientific and engineering box is what it was for. It was designed for satellite, you know, government satellite imagery and medical imaging like MRIs. So I used that to composite visual effect shots and I had to learn compositing down to the atomic level, okay? So I learned in the school of hard knocks. Uh and then then uh just a few years ago I also got an honorary bachelor of arts degree from the Art Center in uh, Denver, Colorado. I I lived in Denver for a while and I was working with the Art Center there teaching their instructors. Okay. So uh, I got I got an honorary bachelor of arts degree from them. So what But what again, year are we talking about here Steve? I'm sorry? What year are we talking about? Oh the uh, bachelor of arts Yeah and before that before you started tinkering around in, in on on the compositing side Oh um that would be in um uh, let's see that would be in the in um the late 90s <laughs> Ah okay okay when we were just getting out of the school and colleges here <laughs> Yes yes 
Yes, I had I had been working at Atari, and at, at Atari, uh, I I wrote video games at Atari. In, in very, okay. This is very very early early uh, days of, of video gaming, but um, that's what got me into computers, graphics, imaging, and pixels. Okay, oh. so it was from Atari I got to Hollywood. Okay. The Atari cassettes, right? They had this uh, cassette which you could put it in the uh, PlayStation kind of a thing to play on. Yeah, yes. I remember those days, the good old days of games. Right. So what, what, what made you ship to VFX? What was your inspiration? Like people, you know, if you talk to boys here and boys and girls here, they are always like, oh, I saw Superman and that inspired me. I saw Jurassic Park and that inspired me. What was your drive to get into the visual effects? Well, now that is an unusual story. Remember, my history goes back very far. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So again, before all of this stuff. So what happened was I was working at Atari, and uh, I got a job offer to work in Hollywood with for Paramount Films, Paramount and Sega. Uh, you know, Sega, the arcade game company. Yeah. Paramount Films and Sega had put together a joint venture to turn Paramount film properties into arcade games. So I was brought in to head up the development team for all those games. Unfortunately, right about that time, so that got me down to Los Angeles in Hollywood on a film studio, okay, for doing, for developing games. Well, what happened was just about the time we got everything set up is, is when the video uh, gaming industry went down, okay? <laughs> it had that big recession. And so Sega and Paramount canceled the project. So I found myself in Hollywood without a job. <laughs> okay. okay. So I had, I had a buddy, I met a guy and we were, we were really good pals. And at that time he worked for Robert Abel and Associates. Now, Robert Abel is one of those foundational creative masters that, that founded the visual effects industry. Okay. Uh, so this, this was back in the days of Magi and uh, digital productions. This is this is visual effects 1.0. Okay. <laughs> so I got a job at Robert Abel uh, working on um, doing television commercials and movie special effects. And my specialty there was the technical market, the scientific and engineering markets for uh, uh, visual effects, like um, uh, congressional briefings uh, to the president and stuff like that. So I, I got went from video games to a joint venture between games and movies to movies. That's interesting. So that, that was your uh, that's what the shift happening from yes. gaming to visual effects. Yes. And how how did you feel about it? I love it. Uh, the interesting thing about the video games was that it. It is both a left brain, right brain activity. It takes technical and artistic. So you need creative and technical skills to do video games. Same thing in visual effects. To be really good at visual effects, you have to have both a technical and an artistic ability. So uh, I, I found it very, very attractive because it used you know, both parts of your brain, right? <laughs> so you have, uh, the thing I loved about compositing was the lovely puzzles, what I call lovely puzzles, okay? <laughs> because you, um, now see a CG artist, he has total control over his world. He sits down at his computer and he's gonna model something. He controls everything. Whereas in compositing, you've been given footage shot by somebody and maybe they didn't shoot it so well, okay? so. That, that provides another whole other level of problem solving. You have to cope with real world problems, okay, in compositing. So did, did it take long for you to adapt? Yes, it did. Um, <laughs> remember, uh, when I bought the Pixar computer for my studio in Hollywood, there were no schools, no books, no instructors, nothing. So I, I got the Pixar computer and the instruction manual, which was, they had a long list of, of image processing operations that, that uh, you put into the computer, which then talked to the Pixar computer, okay? So the Pixar computer was like a gigantic graphics card, <laughs> okay? 
the host computer was a Silicon uh, Graphics 4D70. And so the graphic, the, the Pixar computer was exactly like a, putting a giant graphics card in your workstation. Okay. <laughs> the host computer sends commands to the graphics card, and the graphics card does all of the math and does all the pixel manipulations. That's how the Pixar computer worked. So I got, I, I bought the darn, it cost $80,000. I bought one. I sat down and looked at the instructions, and it was just a list of, of what they did was they, they ran an extension to Unix. They added uh, uh, image processing opera, like a fine rotate, was now a Unix command. And the Unix operating system would see that go, oh, that goes to the Pixar. So it handed off the command to the Pixar who would do the rotate. And uh, so... <laughs> The, uh, the the process was I would to, to composite a shot. I was writing Unix shell scripts, okay, two thousand line Unix shell scripts to composite a visual effects shot. Okay. Wow, that's, that's something. Uh, very yeah, difficult. It was six, it was six months before I thought I was smarter than that darn computer. Okay, but when I finished, I knew compositing, like I said, down to the atomic level. I could do stuff nobody in Hollywood could do because I had the machine and the technology. But what happened was about, about a year after I was doing television commercials, okay, now we were doing the 3D and we were compositing it with the live action and delivering a finished shot to the client, okay? That was my objective, deliver a finished shot. Well, we did that for a year or so, and then Kodak opened up CineSight in Hollywood. Okay, and CineSight in Hollywood was where Kodak, for the first time, offered 2K film scans. The first high-quality film scans became available. Boom! I'm in the movie business. My machine, my, my the, the frame buffer in the Pixar was 4K by 4K. So I, I could work on 2K images without a problem. Okay. So I was, I was immediately in the movie business. Okay, and I, I was the only game in town for a long time. And I worked on a number of, of uh, feature films. So could you please just briefly take us through your professional career? Sure, sure. Um, in, in, uh, in, in the, around 1980, from about 78 to 83, uh, I was at Atari. I was there for about six years. And I started out by writing the games, and then I became manager of the home video game, not the arcade game, but the home video game department on the Atari 2600, which is which was that graphic we had just a minute ago. Okay, so uh, that's that's where I got started. I, I call it pushing pixels to entertain people. <laughs> now, the Atari 2600 was an incredibly primitive machine. I mean, it was that with the first generation video game machine. And it, it was very, very limited in its graphics capability in the hardware. So you had to be very clever in the software in order to make it do things, okay? What that taught me was how to do a lot with a little. And it's a mental discipline that I carried with me all the way forward in my career is, is that lesson from programming video games. From Atari, uh, I went to uh, Robert Abel and Associates. Okay, so from Atari uh, to, the, to um, the Paramount Films lot in Hollywood, but that was a short interval. Like I said, I moved to Los Angeles to, to uh, work there, and within a few months, they had folded the operation. So uh, I was left in Hollywood like I said, un unemployed. Well, that's when I went to Robert Abel and Associates. And I was there for four years. Like I said, he was one of the founding fathers of uh, CGI. This was the time when you wrote the software that you used for the commercial. We had a programming team, a software team of 25 software engineers, and they actually wrote the software for each commercial individually. <laughs> okay. The folks from Robert Abel, when Robert Abel folded, became Wavefront. Okay. Wavefront became uh, Alias Wavefront. And then the Alias Wavefront became Maya. Okay. <laughs> Which, of course, Maya is now the de facto standard in the industry. 
So from uh, Robert Abels, when Robert Abels folded, I was <laughs> I was so sad. I was so sad because uh, Robert, the, the again, the industry was in turmoil. The visual effects industry was in turmoil. Okay, this was VFX 1.0. This was the very early early days of visual effects. So when Robert Abel went out of business, I set up my own my own little studio in Hollywood, uh, and I was there for um, about ten years, almost ten years. And I like I said, I started off by doing just CGI for commercials. And then I said, no, we got to do the compositing. And that's where I got the Pixar computer. And that's when things really took off because I had something unique, something very powerful I could offer my clients. And then Kodak opened up the uh, CineSight operation and I'm in the movie business. Okay, So I did that, my studio for about 10 years. And then we got bought out and I went to CineSight Hollywood. Okay. This was great. Now, see, I was a small studio, so I could not work on the A films. Okay. Well, by, when I moved to Cineside, I was hired in as a senior compositor. <laughs> Boom, on day one at Cineside. And now I'm working on A films, you know, the top of the line blockbusters. Okay. And that, that's a different experience than working on small projects or, or little, little independent films. So I was at Cineside for eight years. And uh, that's while I was at any site was when I wrote my book. And then um, from 2005 to today, so for the last 15 years, I've been doing nothing but training. Okay. Could we put up uh, the, the world client map? Thank you. So since 2005, I've been to all of these countries conducting staff training at visual effects studios all over the world. Can we put up the client list logos, please? And these are some of my clients. Now, some of these are places where I conducted staff training. Other places like the Foundry uh, are places where I produced videos for them. Okay. So, um, and uh, the VES Society, and of course, you, you guys all know about um, Prime Focus and Reliance Media Work, of course. So uh, these are the, the clients that I've done uh, training from Prana Films, uh, was uh, taught, taught Nuke Stereo. They wanted to learn stereo compositing at Prana Films, Prana Studio. <laughs> so, okay, so that, that's my story. And that's where we are today. I, I, I teach and train, that's all I do. Oh, that is that is some awesome journey, Steve. And good good to see India on your map for eleven times. So yeah, that that must have been some experience for you. I need to put up eleven <laughs> flags in India. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us about eleven trips but thirteen studios. <laughs> oh, that's great. So tell us more about those two books that you wrote. What what got you to write those books, and how has the response been to that? Well, it, the, the response has been terrific. Uh, uh, what, what, what happened was I was at CineSight, and I had a longtime friend, uh, a lady named Deborah Kaufman, and she, she was a reporter in the visual effects industry. So she knew everybody in the industry, and she knew also book publishers. So what happened was Focal Press wanted a book on compositing visual effects, and they told Deborah Kaufman about it. So Deborah came to me and said, hey, Focal Press wants a book. You want to write one? And I said, sure. Because, see, I've been teaching and training ever since Atari. I had I was a teacher. At, when I was at Atari, uh, the management put me out to teach video gaming to the staff and to the marketing department and, you know, all like that. So I kind of fell into teaching very, very early into my career. I, I have kind of a natural uh, interest in it. And so from Atari, when I went to CineSight, I continued teaching. I would conduct classes for the staff or publish technical documents. And then um, when I got to, uh, uh, when, when the Focal Press asked me to write the book, I said, sure. <laughs> okay. So that's how I, uh, Focal Press uh, wanted a book on compositing and they asked me to do it. So I did. That's that's great to know. I was always wondering what made you write your 
Right uh, on. And I, I, think, I think it was also it was also a time when there were very less digital tutorials available online. Yeah, very, so very little. Today, yeah, very, very, very little stuff available to learn from. Right. I bet your books were a great help to lot, lot many first generation compositors oh. out there. Thank you. Yeah, I've received an enormous amount of response from from those books. Now there are two of them. The big thick one is the uh, the fourth edition, digital compositing for film and video. Thank you for putting that up. That is the machine side book for a working compositor. Okay, have that next to your workstation. You run into trouble, you flip to chapter seven and look up how to do it. Compositing visual effects was a different different intent. These are for people who are, are not sitting artists, but there may be a producer or a director who want to understand what are visual effects? How do they work? What do I do? Okay. So that's more for a layman who wants to understand visual effects. The digital compositing for film and video is for working artists who want to do visual effects. That's interesting. Thanks. Thanks for giving us a run through this uh, different two books of yours. Uh, today we are at a stage, Steve, where uh, VFX has become a very integral part of a storytelling. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts on that? Yes, um, of course. Visual effects, as, as you say, it's, it's, it's so true, have become a key part of storytelling uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is with visual effects, you can tell any story you want. You're not limited by actors or sets or anything. You, you can go to a whole other planet, a whole other world, a whole other creatures. So by visual effects helps in expanding the scope of the story you can tell. But it also provides mind-blowing visuals that the audience just loves, okay? Absolutely fantastic uh, scenes that you can see on the screen. You can't see any other way. The problem has become the visual attractiveness of those visual effects. They are so exciting, so interesting, that a lot of movie producers focus on that and they ignore the storytelling and the character development and the script, okay? So that has become um, a, a distraction for some movie makers, okay? The key is the visual effects must support the story, not be the story. Yeah, I guess, yes, people can go a bit overboard with visual effects these days, right? Yes. So uh, how would you define digital compositing? Well, uh, I have my favorite quote. I put this into the first edition of my book, if we could put up the compositing quote. Uh, this is my definition of digital compositing. Can we put up the compositing quote? Thank you. There it is. The ultimate artistic objective of compositing is to take images from a variety of different sources, combine them together in such a way that they appear to have been shot at the same time under the same lighting conditions with the same camera. That's the definition of digital compositing. Now, the interesting thing about that is this, this charter to do this has become in, much more difficult over time. Several years ago, uh, by the way, color science has always been a hobby of mine. I really, really enjoy, well, you know, it's technical, it's mathematic, and, and I have a physics major and a, and a you know, math background. So for um, color science, I, I took a seminar from Charles Poynton. Charles Poynton is a world famous uh, uh, color scientist. He works for all the big corporations like Microsoft, and works on things like developing the ICC profiles. And I went to one of his seminars on color science, color management. So it was cost 600 bucks for a one day seminar. So I'm sitting in the audience and there's only about a dozen people in there because this is a pretty esoteric. So color science is a really difficult, painful topic. So we're, we're, we, he starts the seminar and one of the, one of the other students, we raise his hand and he asked, point, he says, well, why do we need color science? And Charles Poynton would, uh, I mean, he was caught flat footed by such a, you know, so my, th my first thought was, if you don't know, what are you doing in this class? Okay, <laughs> why are you attending the seminar? So I raised my hand and Charles Poynton said, okay, you. So I said, 
if you work in a closed color pipeline, like video, video in, video out, or film in, film out, you don't need color science. It's already been taken care of for you. But the minute you try to cross between them, film into video or video out to film, then you need color science. And that has become so much more true today than ever. When you're compositing a shot, you could have a background plate from an airy camera, some CGI, you could have a picture off the web, some video, and a picture of your mom. And you got to put them all in one shot, and you got to make them all look like they belong together. So that's, that's become the challenge in digital compositing, is to be able to cross all those color space lines and that's one of the things Nuke does brilliantly. I, I was thunk, we'll get to that shortly, but, but that was the thing that attracted me to Nuke. The other component in digital compositing is the artistic component. Okay, we are part of the storytelling process. We have to produce a shot that is not only exciting and interesting, but also helps to tell the story. Okay, so. That's the definition of digital compositing, both from a technical and an artistic standpoint. Uh, I think this is a solid uh, advice that we have just given to the students uh, who are attending and some freshers too. Uh, you just mentioned art. Uh, what role does art play in visual effects arts? Well, an enormous role. Uh, we, we think of visual effects on a technical level. Okay, I, I've got my affine transformations and I've got my subsurface scattering in my, in my, in my uh, occlusion mapping. Well, but the artistic component comes from two completely separate directions. One, you have to have enough of an eye to be able to judge when a shot looks real or not. Okay, if you produce a composite that doesn't look real, the audience suddenly stops watching the movie and goes, hey, look at that, that guy doesn't look right. So it takes the audience out of the movie. So the audience can recognize immediately when something is not right. The artist can recognize not only what's, what's not right, but what's wrong. I see the, the color correction on the foreground character, it lacks contrast, but the technical guy knows how to fix it. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, that is the, so let's call that the photorealistic part of the art of compositing is to know, you know, what looks photorealistic. The other one, and this, this goes beyond, this goes to the creative side of compositing. When you composite a shot, you're not supposed to just slap A over B. You're supposed to add something in the compositing process that adds to the shot. So you got to make the shot look more interesting, more exciting, uh, more engaging or scarier. Okay, depending on <laughs> a lot of scary movies out there. Uh, so your job is to enhance the composite and make it look more cool. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that that says it all. Yes, we really need to have that kind of an eye to make a shot look real. So, what and, could be your tip? Be yeah, please carry on. I, I was just going and and the ability to advance the next level to make it interesting, make it cool, make it exciting. Yeah. So, what could be that one tip you can give to people out here? So how can one become a good compositor? Well, the number, the first piece of advice I would give everybody is to learn your tools. Unfortunately, many artists learn a little path through the software and they use the same approach on everything that they do. They don't branch out and learn all the nooks and crannies of their software. Okay. So the, the Japanese have a, a really good saying. Says, if your only tool is a hammer, then everything starts to look like a nail. So you need to expand your knowledge of your tools so that you can use the right tool to solve you know, each, each problem. At CineSight, I was the go-to guy for all the compositors. Whenever they had a problem or got stuck, they came to me. And the reason is, well, there were two reasons. One, 
because I had foundational knowledge of compositing, I, I could help with a lot of technical issues. Okay, but the real, the number one reason was I read the damn manual. I read it from cover to cover, okay? And nobody else did. And I'm like, what? what? Why don't you people read the manual? Okay. <laughs> so, so people get into the habit of just learning what they need, you know, to do with their work, and they never branch out to learn all the others, okay? Uh, so learn your tools. The other thing is uh, gain foundational knowledge of visual effects and movie making. Learn about cameras, lenses, composition, okay? The filmmaking aspects, because we are filmmakers. Too many people think that my job is twiddling knobs in Maya. Okay, to make a, make a really cool spaceship. No, that's the tool you're using for the purpose of making a composition for a movie. Okay, so you know, think in the big picture. Also, in this foundational knowledge, understand image compros image comp uh, image processing science and mathematics. Okay, branch out, learn learn some color management. Okay, learn learn about filters. My God, filters are huge in visual effects. They're a very important tool. Um, I remember uh, one time <laughs> I was called in to, on a shot. They had somebody had a large a large image with text on it, and they needed to scale down a really small and put it on a, on a beer can, like like a product shot in in a movie, right? So they took the label, they scaled it down. And it just broke up into a bunch of little pixels. And then they ran a little blur operation to kind of smooth it out. And they comped it over the beer can. It looked terrible. It was just all broken up and hideous. So they called me over and, and said, well, we, we scaled it down. And then and we put a little blur on it. And now it looks awful. What, what's wrong? What can we do? <clears throat> I said, reverse the operations. Do the blur first and the scale down second. <laughs> Fixed it. <laughs> just by reversing the order of the operations because they didn't understand image processing, okay? My third piece of advice is become a better artist. Pick up an artistic hobby, photography, sketching, painting, sculpting, anything that is an artistic hobby that helps you to develop your sense of art and, you know, your artistic perception of the world. And then, you know, my last piece of advice is... Uh, experience is how you get ahead. You have knowledge of how to solve problems. You have knowledge of how to approach tasks. So study, train, learn. That sounds perfect, Steve. And I bet uh, a lot of people here, uh, old timers, miss those huge manuals that used to come with the software. Yes, this yeah, much. I, yeah, I, three I feet of manuals. Manual. I still have people that lying around. So let's talk about your favorite software here, Nuke. Uh, Nuke uh, yes. has been a very critical part of your training career uh, for this many years. Tell us more about it. Tell us what, what, what's, what's your take on it? What, do you, what draws you to it? Well, uh, the, 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 how I got into Nuke was a really interesting story. Uh, I was teaching Shake, okay, and uh, Shake had Apple had just canceled shake okay and the industry was going oh, what are we going to do because they a lot of studios had built their entire production pipeline around shake so uh i went to the nab show and i asked myself okay what's the next big thing in compositing okay and i said okay it's 3d compositing that would be the next level for compositing and the only folks that did that was new the foundry now, this was at the stage where uh, the Foundry had just acquired Nuke from Digital Domain. I don't know if yeah. a lot of people don't know this, but when Nuke first came out, Digital Domain, who wrote Nuke, um, they had attempted to sell the product and, and you know, make money by, by selling the software. And the problem was selling and supporting software is a completely different business than running a visual effects studio. Digital Domain failed miserably. So they sold it to the Foundry. The Foundry is a professional software development and support company. That's what they do. So it was a perfect marriage. So the Foundry acquires Nuke. 
They're at the NAB show going, nuke, nuke, nuke. And, and I walked up and said, I got the VP of marketing, and I said, I want to teach nuke. And the VP of marketing said, thank you, thank you. <laughs> the problem they were having was that they had just acquired nuke, and they were trying to sell it to a studio, and the studio would say, okay, so where do we get a nuke artist? And the only answer was, go hire them out of digital domain. That's not a good answer. Okay. So when I said, when I stepped up and said, I will teach Nuke, the foundry fell all over them. So they gave me soft, free software, contacts in engineering, documentation, anything I wanted. Boom. Here you go, Steve. Please teach Nuke. Teach Nuke. Because there was nobody, nobody teaching Nuke. So that's, that's how I got into it. Now, what attracted me to Nuke? I think number one was I had an enormous respect for their science and their math and their engine. This 32-bit floating point linear was brilliant. I worked at CineSight for many years, and I watched our engineering department try to write 3D uh, software that we could make CG that would composite with log film scans, okay? Because at, at, in CineSight, everything was 10-bit log, the entire production pipeline. So rendering CGI was a, a problem. So I watched them struggle with that, and they never got it right. Okay, And then I, I read the white paper on, on Nuke's linear light space, and I went, wow, this is the answer. This is why CineSight never got it. You have to be float. You have to be... Uh, in, in 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 linear space okay and neither of those two things were possible in 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 those days at cine site so uh, i got really excited <laughs> and i wrote uh, an article about it i wrote an article about nukes linear light space okay and and how it worked and why it was important and why everybody else is wrong and only nuke is right <laughs> okay <laughs> So I sent the article to the foundry and I said, would you have your boy, have, have engineering check my article, make sure I told the story right. Okay, make sure didn't make any mistakes. So the foundry got back to me in just a couple of days and said, uh, yeah, you told the story right. And would you make a video for us? Okay. <laughs> that was my first of many videos for the foundry. Okay, is uh, Nuke's linear light space. So that was one of my, you know, the thing that really attracted me was their science was really solid. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the, the linear light space of Nuke is, in fact, the core thought behind ACES. ACES is a linear floating point light color space. Okay. So they, they got their math right. The other thing I liked about uh, Nuke was that it was, was forged in the fiery furnace of production. It was written at digital domain by people who were doing compositing of visual effect shots. I mean, it was really sharply focused on the job, okay? So the tools were spot on. And the other thing I liked about it was its, it's, it's uh, completeness. It had a lot of you know, tracking and warping and you know, all kinds of things that we have to do for compositing. So lots of features, excellent science, and a, and a really good solid team back at the foundry supporting it. So you just said a lot of tools. Now, this might sound a bit of a tricky question. What are your Nuke's best features for you? Wow. Um, wow, Nuke's best feature. Well, like I said, uh, it would have to be uh, one, of the, one of their best features is this linear light space. Uh, with linear light space, I can combine in one shot uh, some airy camera raw, some DPX log files, so a quick time movie in Rec 709. I can combine all of those into one shot. Okay, and that is a tremendous feature. The Nukes floating point uh, math and linear light space is the bridge between CGI and live action. Okay, it's that's what makes it work between those two worlds. Uh, some of the other things, I, I love Nuke's camera tracker. Um, it's not it's not an $18,000 camera tracker. Okay, I call it a, a really good $2,000 camera tracker. <laughs> but they've integrated the camera tracking with a point cloud generator, with, with skinning operation and, and support tools all are packed all around. 
uh, that when you combine them together, they make a very powerful package. I love the Nuke 12.1, the new edge extension node is wonderful. Um, I used to teach how to do that using crude, several different Nuke nodes together. You bolt them together and you can create that process. Uh, and, and I even put it in the fourth edition of my book, how to do that. Then Nuke came out with a node that does it. And it is wonderful. I use it for many, many things other than what it was intended for. <laughs> it has a, a, a number of wonderful uses. So um, the, the other one of the other best features of Nuke, and I, and, I, and I have to say this, is the Foundry itself. They have a huge team of very smart engineers. They're supporting, they're developing, and they're they're producing what, what the market needs. They listen to the audience. So one of the important features of Nuke is the Foundry. Okay, providing superb support for the product. So I guess you really enjoy a very nice relationship with the Foundry team there, right? I do indeed. I do indeed. I, I, I've known, you know, the CEOs and the CTOs and the product developers for, for many, many years. Yes. So it's a very symbiotic relationship that you have. So that's, yeah. that's, that's the strength of it. So. Yeah. Well, in the early days, I was... I was the early guy, but of course not today. There's many, many new trainers. Okay, so I'm one of many now. <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're still a legendary, Mr. Steve Wright. Well, golly gee. <laughs> so uh, moving on, what would be your suggestions for new and professional artists? Well, um, okay, for for the, the novice or what what you might call a fresher. Yeah. Uh, you again. You need to deepen your knowledge, okay? Don't stop learning just because you finished school. So again, study, train, learn. The other thing for a novice is building a focused demo reel, okay? One mistake that a lot of freshers make is they take every project they've ever done and pack it together into one demo reel. No, don't do that. The thing you gotta remember is the comp supers that are looking at these demo reels these are very busy people. They only want to see a two or three minute demo reel. Okay, and they're going to plug your demo reel in, hit play, or go to your website, hit play. And they're going to watch about ten seconds of it, and they're going to decide whether you're worth watching at all. Okay, so instead of throwing everything you've ever done into a demo reel, you have to pick a few of your best projects. The other thing is it needs to be focused. They are looking to hire a roto artist or a paint artist or, you know, so don't show them CGI. Don't show them green screen compositing. That's not what they're looking for. So too many artists make a shotgun demo reel. And what you want to do is have a focused demo reel that, uh, that says, I would be a great roto artist. That's how you get into the business is roto and paint. That's roto, paint and um, clean up, okay? So a focused demo reel. For the professional, the, the people that are, you know, currently working in the industry, again, I would recommend, again, more study, more training, more learning, okay? <laughs> but for the professional now, what you want to add to that list is networking. 90% of all job opportunities come up because your name was mentioned in a meeting, okay? So you want to network with people, stay in touch with them, so that when uh, when the company says hey, uh, we need a we need another compositor, who can we get? Then somebody will raise your name. That's how you get work in the industry. The other thing I would strongly recommend to professionals is to develop a, a real strong sense of teamwork. Okay, visual effects is a team sport, so you need to develop a sense of teamwork working well with others. Um, and, you know, you don't want people saying, oh, don't, don't hire that guy because he's a real jerk, you know? <laughs> so you want to really develop a sense of teamwork and also sharing. Um, I had noticed as a cultural difference between India and, and the West. In India, people tend to want to keep their knowledge to themselves. In the West, People are more sharing. Hey, Fred, how do I do that? Oh, no problem. Here, I'll show you. Okay. So they're much more giving of their knowledge in the West than they are in India. And I would 
uh, suggest that the Indians try to develop that sharing the knowledge uh, culture because that benefits everybody, okay? So teamwork, develop a sense of teamwork. I think that's that's a great uh, that that's some great tips and advice there from you, Steve. Uh, moving on ahead, uh, these days we have a lot of things, uh, a lot of people talking about virtual production, uh, yes. especially after Mandalorian's uh, success and the way things are moving with game engines and LED screens on set. Uh, what's your take on it? Well, th those uh, have a. They're, they're another tool. They're not the answer and how everything is going to go. They're a very important additional tool. Uh, the problem in the Mandalorian, you're referring to the big LED screen that they use to shoot against. Okay. Well, the thing you got to remember about that is it's a big flat screen. Okay. And you're shooting a character in front of it that gives you very limited camera action. Okay. So you have to be careful of you know how far you can how far you can throw it so it's another tool in the toolbox what it does is it, is it wildly expands our creative ability so that's that's a very important uh, a very important tool and um it, it also enhances our creative ability we can see the cg environment in real time behind the character they're even working on um you know the character in a mocap suit they're, they're developing technology for viewing a real-time, fully rendered view of the mocap character. So that add that to your virtual uh, environment, and you have you really got something. But don't forget, an awful lot of our visual effects entail live action. Okay, so we still got to yeah. go out and shoot the desert, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there, there, there are some shots that it cannot just replace, right? So. Right. Well, it's also, you know, it's expensive, okay? You, it, I mean, if you tried to do an entire movie using nothing but that tech, you, you might have a $500 million movie. I don't know, you know, that it's expensive, okay? So... <laughs> uh, so, uh, as you all know, you know, the, the VFX industry has been uh, hit pretty bad with uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what are your VFX, uh, what are your views on uh, VFX industry post COVID-19? Well, um, of course, COVID-19 is a disaster for the world, India, America, everybody. And what you have up on the screen, these, this, this is the list of the foundry clients. Um, and I, I use that in when I'm talking about Nuke and the foundry and how important they are to the industry. I mean, just just look at that client list. Okay, those those are just some of the people. Nuke is the de facto compositing software for the fee, for for the movie industry. But as far as COVID nineteen goes, um, what it it has actually provided, I believe, on the other side of COVID nineteen, it has presents us with a huge new opportunity for employment. Because of COVID nineteen, the studios. The visual effects studios were forced into remote production models. Okay, the artists are sitting at home, and the artist at home does not need a big workstation because it's all up on the cloud. The software is on the cloud, the images are on the cloud, and the uh, the remote artist is sitting in front of his workstation, which is really just a smart terminal now. Okay, and it talks to the cloud. The images are uploaded and down to downloaded quickly over high high bandwidth uh, internet. So I'm sitting in my home in South Carolina working on a feature film shot in Hollywood. Okay. So COVID-19 has forced this remote production model. Well, when we finish with COVID, we're on the other side. I think a lot of that is going to stick. A lot of studios are going to say, Hey, you know, we were forced to develop the tech and the and the and the uh, procedures because of COVID-19. But now that we've got it all working, it works really well. In fact, we could save a lot of overhead if we didn't have to have a, a brick and mortar building with 250 people in it. You know, with lunch rooms and conference rooms and screening rooms, we could now have a much smaller building with a core staff of maybe 50 people. 
And then we can have remote artists on project basis. This is a very efficient economic model for producing visual effects. So I'm expecting after COVID is gone for this remote production to be uh, become the new model for the industry. Uh, do you also see a lot of work, uh, the scope of work for visual effects increasing because of social distancing parameters and everything rules and regulations in place? Yes, the, the scope of work, uh, there is a never ending, there's two forces going on here, two factors. One, there is an, an endless appetite for visual effects on the part of the viewer. The audience loves visual effects. They're exciting. They're, you know, they show you things you've never seen before. Okay. So you have that force going on. And then in addition to that, the breakup of the uh, distribution system in television. Okay. It used to be there were three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. I don't know about India. Okay. But there were just these three. Well, now, I mean, Netflix, Hulu, Zing Pao, Fubar, Ding Dong. I mean, all these people are all there are now. Amazon is making their own television. Are you kidding me? Amazon is making movies. Okay. So everybody is now in the movie business. I, I think the uh, pivotal moment was Game of Thrones. Okay. Yeah. When HBO produced their own proprietary show. This was not the movie studios. This was not the networks. This was a private producer, boom, they had a huge hit and everybody went, Ooh, I want to do that too. So now everybody's a movie maker. Okay. Studios are popping Netflix studios, Hulu. I mean, they're all popping up to produce their own content and their own content. A lot of it entails visual effects. So you have an explosion in demand for all these different projects. Now, uh, you know, you know, 10 years ago, there might have been a dozen effects movies in production at one time. But today, there's 100 because of all these different outlets all producing their own stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it, yes, it, the future is very exciting. That was a very good take on post COVID situation from you, Steve. Uh, we really needed to hear that uh, positive note of everything picking up and everything's going to be fine and maybe yes. better than what it was yes. uh, in the coming days. Okay. We, we will get uh, through I, this and we will yeah, be better, we will stronger and happier. <laughs> yes. uh, I guess we can throw the floor open for questions now, Framebox mm -hmm. team. Yes, let's do that. Which question do, would you like to choose? I think people are shy. They're not been asking any questions. Um, okay. 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 Yes. So. so we had one question. One uh, question from Mr. Vicky Jain. Work from home. How you see VFX industry? Will this work for VFX? I think we have already answered that question. Good. That means it's a good webinar. <laughs> <laughs> According uh, according to you, in a specific field of compositing, uh, would you like to see Indian artists should take up compositing as a career? Absolutely. Um, Indians, I love their sense of art. Okay, I love Indian art. Art is a huge part of Indian culture. Um, Indians have a really great eye. So the artistic side of, of visual effects is, is uh, something that the Indians do very well. But also your culture, you're very strong in education, you're very strong on, on science and mathematics, are very technical. So those are the perfect combinations for visual effects, technical and artistic. Boom, Indians, very successful. Uh, there's a very interesting question here. Uh, Due to the situation as most artists are working from home, what would be the best way for artists to further improve their work, minimize mistakes uh, in doing self quality checks? Oh boy, that is a really good question. Um, one of the, 
<laughs> One of the things I teach my students is you inspect your work yourself. Do not let the comp super find your mistakes. You find your mistakes. So I, I teach them how to, to QC their own shots, okay? Uh, one of the things that a lot of artists do not realize is that the monitor, your workstation monitor, has a very limited dynamic range compared to the projection theater or the color, digital coloring, the DI suite, the digital intermediate uh, suite. So if you have composited a character into a shot, and let's say the black levels of your character are, are, are elevated, raised just a little bit, you might not see that on your workstation monitor. But when it goes for coloring to the colorist, he's going to slam the contrast, project it on a, on a high dynamic range projector, and your character is going to pull out of the picture and look awful. So I teach my students what I call gamma slamming. You take the gamma and you slam it down, and that makes any separations in, in the brights show up. And then you raise it up, and that teases the black levels apart. Okay, so you inspect your shot, check your edges, check your grain, no chattering edges, no dark outlines. Okay, so I, I teach to inspect your own shot to find your mistakes before the comp super does. And what you need to be able to do that is training, training, training. <laughs> Uh, we get there's one very interesting question, a small one, but very important. What do you consider to be a role of a supervisor? Ah, the, the role of the supervisor is really a coach. Okay. He, he is to help his team. He's, he's to build a team. He's a team builder. And, and his job is not to make him look good, but to make sure that the team looks good. Okay. We work as a team. And again, back to this sharing of the knowledge, okay? And uh, not, not just to find mistakes, but to actually teach people so they don't make those mistakes. Now, he is also the comp super, I mean, at least in the West, the comp super is also to set the look for a sequence. I got, I got five shots in the bedroom. So the comp super will typically maybe comp the first shot himself, set up all the color, for uh, for the color correction for the shot, and maybe even hand a script to other people that they build on, so that there's a consistency between all five shots from the bedroom scene. Okay, so he is uh, a, a teacher and and a and a team builder. Another important one, yeah. How do you see the impact of AI deep fakes and their ability to generate seamless visual effects? affecting the current compositing process? Well, AI uh, has an enormous potential in our, in our industry. Uh, one of the problems with AI is with visual effects, one of the, like, like doing a roto or a key, okay? It's all about the edges, okay? And to, to, to do a good composite, you have to get the edges right. The core is easy. The background is no problem. It's, it's all about the edges. Okay. So the problem with using AI, for example, to do automated roto, is when you get to the edge, the, the best place to put the line now becomes a question of judgment and experience, not, not necessarily knowledge. So I'm not, I'm not sure AI is going to have a very big impact on uh, that part of our work. Okay. So the, the, the other thing is that um, getting, getting a, a, a picture to look photorealistic is a comp this is the most complicated image processing, processing engine in the world right here. Okay. And we, we do a tremendous amount. I can't tell you how frustrated I have spent hours in front of the computer trying to key something. And I'm going, I do not get this. I can see, I know exactly where this character is or where this object is. Why can't I make a key to isolate it? Okay. <laughs> well, it's difficult because we are using our image processing engine here to identify objects and to separate them from the background. But this is a tremendous amount of intelligence. Okay. 
So very, very difficult to, to duplicate that uh, with artificial intelligence. It'll be a, I can see a first generation of AI tools that are human assisted, human guided, okay? The operator will, will give it information and it'll, it'll help correct the shot. But uh, it'll be a long time before AI can really t make a big contribution to what we're doing. Uh, the next is, uh, is it usual for an artist to have an experience with both 3D modeling and VFX compositing? Um, most, most artists will pick one over the other, okay? Now, I was an exception. Uh, when I first started in the industry, there was no compositing, okay? So when I first started uh, working in, in uh, the visual effects industry, uh, I was a 3D animator. Okay, I did three years in, in when I set up my studio. Uh, I did 3D. I sat at the machine and I modeled stuff and I rendered stuff and I was a 3D artist uh, in, in my own shop. Uh, and it wasn't until I got my hands on the Pixar computer that I was able to start compositing. Okay. So I have experience in both 3D and 2D. Now, I want to warn visual effects artists that you must become knowledgeable of 3D because nukes half of nukes compositing tools are 3d okay <laughs> so you you need to understand you know surface normals and deformation lattices and all the, the polygons and, and vertices and all that kind of stuff uh, to be a good nuke compositor in fact in my course on, on nuke compositing i have a 2d section and i have a 3d section okay so i teach them as two separate bodies of knowledge <clears throat> because you need to you need to do both you need to have an understanding of 3D to be an effective compositor today. The next one is how can you be a creative director? What should be the approach? Well, the creative director is the emphasis is on art and design. Okay. Being able to envision fantastic visual effect shots. That's what the creative director does. Okay. So, Excuse me. <clears throat> you want to become artistic. Like I was saying earlier, photography, sketching, make some student films. Okay. Composition, camera, blocking. Okay. What, what makes a good shot? Okay. That is the, the whole thing about a creative director is what makes an exciting, interesting shot. So the emphasis is on art and filmmaking. <clears throat> uh, the next one is pretty sweet, actually. Uh, I think that's an aspiration for many students here. How can one enter in Hollywood industry for animation? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get, get this fresh question because it had the sweet element, and I think a lot of aspiration to that question. Well, yeah, yes, I, and I understand. Um, the... The, the, the thing is, of course, that there's an awful lot of Americans that want to enter the uh, Hollywood industry for animation, okay? And it's easier to hire a domestic artist than there is to import somebody from India, okay? So one of the first things you might want to try to do is get to America, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, but uh, being absolutely outstanding, that is how you would do it, is just be outstanding, Okay, head and shoulders above the other uh, animation artists. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, just one minute. Uh, how much time should uh, one give on a, on a scale of his or, his or her interest while working as an employee in a company using other skills? I'm sorry, the, the question did not come up on the screen. Oh, okay, how, how much time should one give on the skill of his or her working on? Oh, um, oh, you mean improving your skills? Yes, uh, yeah, okay. Yes, that person means some other skill, you know, that he might, he might be interested in creative comm, but he's doing roto at work. Right, well, the, the obvious answer is as much time as you can possibly spare because that is how you will get ahead, okay? So you, you need, you are going to be advanced, not because you're a swell guy, okay, but because your knowledge, your experience, 
and your artistic ability is very impressive. So you want to spend as much time as, as you possibly can, maybe stay after work. Um, what, what I always did, uh, and, and this, this, I found this helpful many, many times, was from my department, I, I would work in a department in a corporation, okay? Whether that was Atari or, or Robert Abel or whatever, whatever department you're working in, I went to the department upstream of me and learned what their job was. And I went to the department downstream of me to learn what their job was. So I understood how my work fit into the overall production pipeline. And I got to tell you, that has, that has paid me back a thousand times. I'll tell you a great story when I was working at CineSight. I was a senior compositor and a technical 2D technical director at CineSight. And uh, Kodak opened up the digital intermediate division. So this was now the first time we were going to color time movies digitally. So I went over to the brand new DI department and introduced myself. And I, I started to assist them, to help them with their digital imaging problems. Okay, So I became their go-to guy for the digital intermediate department. Well, fast forward two more years and Kodak shuts down the Hollywood division of CineSight, but not the digital intermediate department. So CineSight Hollywood, and that was a very grave day, shut down all the visual effects in CineSight Hollywood. They laid off every single artist in the building, except for me. I was the one guy that the company kept because the DI department asked for me. <laughs> We we need Steve. Keep Steve. We don't don't let Steve go. <laughs> okay. So I stayed on another two years working with the DI, and I learned all about digital intermediate processes. Okay. And so basically, by by becoming uh, by working with people in the, in the other departments before and after my department, it got me job opportunities, career advancement. And, and dramatically increase my knowledge of my business and my industry. Okay, we have a question up here from Vicki Jane. What is the future of stereo since virtual production uh, is what a lot of people are talking about? Well, stereo is a display technology. And um, uh, frankly, <laughs> <laughs> it was a big thing. I remember going to the NAB show and SIGGRAPH like just four or five years ago, and everything was stereo, stereo televisions, you know, stereo uh, production, stereo compositing, stereo CG. Well, st we've done a few stereo movies, okay? But um, it, the stereo has not taken over the whole industry. So it, it is kind of dropped down to a lower level of interest now. Stereo is completely different than virtual production, okay? Uh, virtual production can be used for creating stereo, but the demand for stereo has dropped off. It's not zero, but it is lower than it was a few years ago. I remember a few years, I mean, I went to Prana Studios specifically to teach them stereo compositing with Nuke, okay? Well, I don't get such offers today because the demand for stereo has dropped down to a, we'll call it a maintenance level. Okay, there, there's a few stereo movies. Uh, there might be six or eight stereo films a year now. Okay, <clears throat> but it's no longer the rage. And yeah. there are stereo TVs. TVs are stereo compatible, but nobody's producing really any stereo programming content for them for television. But virtual production does make stereo easier. So what, according to you, platform to get a work, say, what made you choose the path of VFX? Okay, well, those are two different questions. <laughs> yeah. An ample platform, uh, in, in my book, anything that'll run Nuke, okay? <laughs> that, uh, that that would be an ample platform uh, to, to, to get work. Uh, you, can, you can even do Nuke on a laptop, okay? Uh, it, it's really amazing. Uh, the, 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 I, re <laughs> I remember I had the Pixar computer. I told you that story, an $80,000 box that did nothing, but it was, like I said, it was a giant graphics card, right? 
I, I got a stopwatch one day and I could do an A fine rotate of a 2K image. I could rotate a 2K image in under seven seconds. Amazing back then. Well, now my watch has more pow processing power than, than that Pixar computer. So the a, an astonishing amount of power is built into the machines and, and are also the, the move towards GPUs. More and more software is written to be GPU compliant. So with a, with a good graphics card uh, and, a, and a chunk of memory, chunk of RAM, and the, with your GPU, you can do astonishing you know, particle systems and all kind of neat stuff on a, a rather small uh, platform now. And uh, what made me choose the path as a VFX artist? Um, well, like I said, um, when I got into, opened my own studio in, in Hollywood, uh, I wanted to give the client a finished composited shot. And that's what got me into compositing visual effects. So I think that was the last question uh, we have time for. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, the entire Framebox uh, team for having us on here and giving me a chance to share the screen with legendary Mr. Steve Wright. Ken. Gosh, it's a pleasure thank having you on here, Steve. Uh, I, I, stay would also, uh, I would also like to thank Framebox myself. They're a leading training company for India and the world. And I'm looking for great things to come out of Framebox in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay in. Take care, wherever you guys and girls are. Cheers.